You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and in this episode, Brett and I will try to do something pretty daunting. Talk through the cinema of Burkina Faso. Look at the biggest and most acclaimed films and highlight our favorites. Nicknamed the home of African cinema, courtesy of the highly respected Felpaco Festival, a festival created before the country had a single feature film to their name, Burkina Faso grew to become one of the most respected national cinemas on the entire continent. A cinema we can perhaps still mainly explore through the filters of what has actually been released and promoted in the West, with one of their key directors, Idrissa Wedrago, criticized for making films primarily for Western rather than local audiences. Is there a breadth of exciting films we just haven't been exposed to? Or is it that what is being greenlit in the first place is still too closely tied to European and especially French pockets? And what exactly is it? about the films from Burkina Faso that have appealed to Western audiences for decades. The country was heralded as one of the key cinema nations of Africa in the 80s, 90s and early zeros. But what about today? Has it gotten a little silent? What is the state of Burkina cinema in the 21st century, especially over the last decade? Luckily, Burkina Faso has a small enough selection of key venerated films to make this episode remotely possible. Though I must also press that neither of us are meant to be experts. We are just people who watch and talk about films. So let's just do that, Brett. And uh, don't worry, listeners, we will keep this episode relatively spoiler-free so that you can listen along no matter which of these films you may or may not have seen. So, with those worries hopefully at ease, uh, what about our worries? Uh, Brett, how do you feel about trying to talk through the cinema of an entire nation? I'm not too worried, to be honest, because I I think we're clear that we're only sharing our opinions and our own thoughts as opposed to trying to establish a be-all and end-all encapsulation of the entire cinematic output of a single country. So I think we'll be okay. Thank you. The disclaimers are out there. And like me, you have been consuming yourself in just a, a pretty decent amount of uh, breaking out of films over the last uh, two weeks or so in, in particular. How, what was your experience of uh, just seeing so many films from this nation b- back to back? Did it, it change your perspective on uh, films from Burkina Faso at all? Well, prior to... This year, I'd seen five Burkinabe films, and I saw another seven in the past week and a half. So it was rather condensed. And my average rating for Burkinabe films stayed just about the same. So I don't think my perspective has changed too much, but it has definitely expanded. Uh, I think, especially with the films that I saw recently, they explored different types of cinema. And I was also able to see some more recent films this time, whereas before I had mostly seen some of the classic ones from the 80s and 90s that Burkina Faso was mostly well known for in cinematic circles. I think that's pretty true, because uh, as it may be, Burkina Faso is still mainly known for a few big films from the 80s. And the uh, 90s, I, I mean, I remember trying to work through Sharon A. Russell's uh, Guide to African Cinema. And uh, obviously, it, it's a bit of an older b- book at the moment uh, as well. But that's obviously where the big films like Samboko, Tilai, Budiam, etc. Th- these are all highlighted. And th- those are the kind of films that have been discussed for a very long time as well. And we'll discuss them in this episode too. But uh, it's nice to see that, you know, the, the production kept going, there's still quite interesting films being made in Burkina Faso, even though they're not as uh, discussed today, sadly. 
For me, uh, watching a, a, a lot of uh, these films back to back, it did make me realize something that I hadn't really thought about before, which is that the, the large majority of these show uh, people in very traditional setting. Many of them are set in the past, but even the films set in uh, the contemporary era uh, are mainly set in villages that are a, a bit behind the, uh, in the times. And that's not really something you see in the films from a lot of other African countries where they often, like you have these films that are set in the past, which are, you know, uh, based on legends, fables, stories. But in modern day, you still have people, you know, driving around, along on motorcycles in, in big cities. You have uh, that big city living, it looks at big city social issues. But in the big films from Burkina Faso, it's mainly just been films set in these rural areas. And I wonder if that, that's in part Perhaps why Burkina Faso got the stats it got, if it's some kind of exoticism involved, if Western audiences are particularly intrigued by, you know, these kind of clay huts, stone huts, this kind of very specific look that we see over and over and over again in, in, in these films. Uh, well, what do you think? I think that's a possibility, especially with earlier days of Burkina Faso cinema, that sort of exoticism and otherness for Western audiences of seeing something they would not have been necessarily regularly exposed to. I have seen a lot of rural motifs in other African cinema that I've seen, and I think one thing we do have to remember is that urbanization in most of Africa south of the Sahara is a relatively recent thing. Most of the countries, for most of their history, have been largely rural. And it's only been in the last, say, 20 to 30 years that urbanization has really ramped up and they've become much more urban countries. So back in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s, when a lot of these films were being made, the vast majority of the population was living in rural areas. So that it just kind of makes sense that those are the stories that people were telling. I mean, you still see some urban tales being told. Um, Zamboko, I think, is the most prevalent one. But I think also a lot of the films from this era also focus on the history and the folklore of Burkina Faso. And that is just so rich. And I think it's also, again, a novelty of sorts for Western audiences to see these types of stories being played out on screen that are completely foreign to them. And I think that's probably been another reason for the appeal of those films, especially if, as you said, Wedrago had been, or, sorry, I'm, I might be butchering his name here, Wedraogo, um, was making films catering to a Western audience and what he thought they wanted to see. And, and I mean, speaking for this Western audience member, I mean, that, that is also one of the things that really intrigued me about the cinema of Burkina Faso. As well, I mean, Tilai is probably my uh, favorite Burkinaba film, and that focus on the legend, the landscape, it is different, and it does have a very unique uh, appeal. So, so I can see, definitely see why uh, his films uh, and the films of Burkina Faso's other key director, Gaston Cabure, which in many cases focus on the same kind of fables and legends and uh, shots of uh, villages in the past and present. I, I think that that kind of visual certainly has a kind of, what, what to say, if not exoticism, a kind of it factor, a kind of dip factor of this is not something Western audience is indeed used to. Uh, and it, it, it's really easy to be consumed in that and intrigued by that. Uh, and to uh, dive all the way back to perhaps the very beginning, because this is where uh, the cinema of Burkina Faso uh, essentially began. I mean, looking up sources of what the very first film from the country was, some say, including the Harvard Film Archive, that it was Gaston Cabore's Vend Tuni, or God's Gift, as it's called in uh, English, that was the first film. Some sources, including BBC, listed as the second film, a uh, feature film created in Burkina Faso. So there's Tom questionability about it, but it's certainly one of the very first. And this was a large, large hit here in the West. It's one of the films that's been written about the most. Uh, it, it's set 
a long time in the past. It's set in the uh, pre-colonial era and it follows a young child that is found and taken in by a family. And we just follow it in so much quiet observation, really. It's it's a very different film from what a lot of us and audiences used to. It, it's almost minimalist. I mean, it, it's not quite, uh, you know, Bresson, but it, it's very stripped back, quiet, uh, and serene. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on uh, Ben Cuny? So, actually, I think it's the second film. Um, I'm aware of a film called The Sang de Paria, or The Blood of Pariahs, from 1973, which think, seems like it might be the earliest Burkinabe film. So that would have come out a decade before Wend Cooney. Um, I did enjoy Wend Cooney more or less. Uh, I thought it was an interesting tale and uh, it was quite serviceable. Um, but it didn't necessarily speak to me as something special. So it didn't really leave a lasting impression on me, except to say that I enjoyed it. Keep in mind, though, that this was also the first Burkinabe film I'd ever seen, almost five years ago. So I wonder if I had time to rewatch it before this podcast, if my opinion would have changed some now that I'm a bit more familiar with not just the, the history and the culture of the country, but also the style of the filmmaking. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I don't remember if Van Cunha was the first film from Burkina Faso, so, but it was one of my first as well. I liked it, I enjoyed it, but it, it was almost a bit too stripped bare for me. And that, that's a bit of an odd thing to say as someone who, you know, is, is quite a big fan of Bresson and uh, a, a lot of uh, minimalist filmmakers. But I, I think... At the time, at least, when, when I saw it, I was missing a bit of the visual flair, this, that kind of more stilted, hyper-visual look that many of these slower films tend to go for, especially in Europe and Asia. And that was missing. I was still very entranced by it. I thought it was beautiful, simple. Uh, and I thought the, the landscape and the way uh, Kaboya captured it w- was quite striking, but it, it didn't quite speak to me in the plotting and the characters uh, to the point that it became anywhere near a favorite for me. Yeah, it just it just sort of was a good film, and overall it left a positive impression upon me, but nothing stood out about the film. And then shortly thereafter, I saw uh, the sequel. It came out 15 years later, Budiam. Again, if anyone's listening and we are butchering these pronunciations, please do feel free to correct us and come on the forum and let us know just how exactly (laughs) these names and titles should be properly pronounced. But I I saw Budiam and I did like that one a bit more. I don't know if perhaps Cabaret had evolved more as a filmmaker um, over those 15 years or if it was just the story was a bit more accessible, but I did... I did find that I enjoyed this one more, especially the cinematography and the soundtrack I found connected with me better or suited the story better. And it's a, it's a, a very loose sequel. So there's not much connected. You don't really need to see Wend Cooney in order to watch Budyam. This film, Budyam actually had been selected for our World Cup that we did in the forum. And so that was why I'd watch Wend Cooney because I wondered if it would have influenced. And I, so I wanted to see that film first. But then when I watched Budiam, I was like, well, nothing really was that affected by the events. It just it provided a bit of an interesting backstory. But I, I wouldn't say that backstory was essential to understanding or even enjoying Budiam. It was just like an extra bonus. Yeah, I, I think so, too. It, it's worth saying, it's worth mentioning that we actually use the same actor. So it is uh, Serge I- Iano, not going to mention his name, Serge Yanogo, who plays... Uh, when Cooney in both films, so he's aged uh, with with the passing of time, and I think that's a really interesting choice as well. I, I actually had the opposite reaction for you. I, I still enjoyed Budiam well enough, but I, I think I saw them almost back to back as well. And as someone who wasn't completely entranced in when Cooney, Budiam felt like a little bit more of the same, which makes sense for for a sequel to a to a point, but. It just didn't immerse me anymore. And uh, I think I actually slightly prefer the emotion in Van Cuny. You know, you know, when, uh, when you get like why he's been silent for such a long time. So slight decrease for me, but uh, it's definitely two films anyone interested in films from uh, Burkina Faso should seek out. 
Yes. And I think an- another reason why I didn't necessarily enjoy it as much is that, and I think this is a common trend, especially in the early days of African cinema, is that the vast majority of the actors did not have film acting experience. Yeah. And I think that that really shows on screen. And mm-hmm. the first films that I saw that really stood out to me and it kind of took away from some of my enjoyment. But the more films I've seen, the less that bothers me and the less that I feel that's super important to how much I enjoy a film. And I think it's also perhaps just a different style of acting that we're not, I'm not necessarily used to seeing and I'm learning to appreciate that more. And I've noticed that with the films that I've seen over the past week or two, that even if the acting isn't that great or it's noticeably stilted or it seems like mm. they're just, you know, memorizing lines, it doesn't affect the mood of the film as much as it maybe it would have for me a couple of years ago. So I think that's another thing as well that I'm seeing as a common thread amongst these Burkinabe films. Yeah, I, I think that's visible in pretty much all of them and, and t- to varying success. I think that almost works better in the films that are set in the past or are kind of fable based lyrical etc because then it kind of comes with this kind of all a theatrical presentation if you will and uh, this is something we often see in films in the west as well we have either non-trained actors we have a present did we kind of just you know beat them down uh, to kind of make them as monotone as possible that's, that's not what's happening here but th- there is this kind of earnestness in non-professional actors that can really speak to you in the right setting and some of the films that are set in modern day feel slightly more off uh, because of that, because it don't feel as natural. But but I still think the style works, uh, certainly. And I think that's the main reason why Budiam worked better for me than when Kuni was because it was also fewer child actors. And looking oh, yeah. back at my notes, it, it <laughs> that just didn't work for me in that first <laughs> film. And it's interesting because in between those two films, Cabaret made two others. Zamboko and Ravi. And surprisingly, he's only made these four feature films. He's made some other films, shorts and, and other works. But from what I can tell, he's only made these four films. And I don't know why, because he's, he's still alive. He's still relatively young. I think he's only in his early 70s, if that. And yet he hasn't made a new film since the late 90s. And I couldn't find any information as to why. Yeah, that it's it's really bizarre. I mean, I know that he opened uh, a school for cinema in the two thousands, uh, and maybe he's just dedicating uh, his time there. But it's it's a very odd choice for uh, the director who, for a large period of time, was essentially the sole or, or prime representative of the cinema of an entire nation. I mean, you would think he would go on directing it's just very very odd i mean i I know that some films from Burkina Faso just don't show up on wikipedia or imdb just because that they aren't being spoken about in i i guess western circles that update wikipedia (laughs) yeah but uh, i don't think that would be the case with uh, his his films it's an odd choice It's, it's certainly missed i would love to see his take on a story in modern times you know 25 years after his last film, I would love to see not just how his filmmaking style and, and thoughts have changed, but also I would think Burkinabe society has changed so much in the intervening years. I would love to see how he would capture that on screen. Yes, I mean, he continued the story of uh, Van Cuny 15 years later, so I mean, it's even longer ago now, but we'd be interested to see him tackle something like Sambuco again, which I mean, at least for me, Sambuco is his best film. I think he it's the film of his you like the most as well, right? Yeah, Zamboko, I like slightly more than Budiam. I would say it's definitely my favorite film by him. Yeah, it's same here. I mean, I was actually a bit frozen on that one the first time I saw it. I, I watched it yesterday. I'm really happy I did it. It's quite a good film. I mean, uh, like you said, there's a lot of non-professional uh, acting. I think that's probably one of the things that worked against it the first time for me. Uh, there's also a, a, a lot of what we say, really over the top direct messaging about corruption, about society in general. Uh, that's just really straightforward. But seeing it now, that's just part of this very specific style. And I think it, it worked much better for me uh, after, you know, seeing so many more films from, uh, from this country. And the story is quite, quite powerful. I think it's one that it's still relevant. I mean, it's about the expansion of, of a city onto 
the land of farmers, uh, the corruption of people just putting their friends in places, building big villas next next to these very poor areas, essentially just taking over their lives, doing with them as they wish just because they have the connections. It's quite brutal, but the film makes it very big. It's very harsh around, around, uh, harsh around this topic, but it, it doesn't feel necessarily tragic either. It, it's a really interesting experience, which I'm really exciting, not necessarily visuals, but just shots. Uh, like like most of his films, they're not uh, overly stylized, but these shots from the villa where you see, you know, the child of this rich family just looking over the white fence into these clay huts. That that's a really striking image. That's definitely staying with me. Yeah, I I think that the the story and the messaging is what resonated with me most. I agree, the acting was was not very good, but again, it didn't detract from me that much to my enjoyment in the film. I was a bit confused at the beginning just because I, the story just kind of moved so rapidly and, and there were so many characters introduced at the beginning. And then I think there was a time jump of uh, a, a couple months or a couple years that it just left me confused and I wasn't sure who was who anymore. But once that sort of got sorted out, I was able to get into the film a lot more. And I, I really liked the messaging. I really liked the way that it was being portrayed and the different characters and their dilemmas and... I was a bit surprised to see a film about corruption from the mid eighties, because from my understanding of the history of Burkina Faso, and again, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. It's normally a, a democracy, but it's had some pretty autocratic leaders in the past. And I, right now I know it's going through some pretty difficult political times. So to see such pretty open criticism of bureaucracy and political connections from 30 some odd years ago was a bit surprising and I think a bit daring on, on his part. And so I think that also resonated with me more as well. Yeah, completely. It feels like a really brave film. I'm surprised he was, like if that had been his last film, I would have said that that's probably why he wasn't allowed <laughs> to make a film again, but obviously kept making films for a decade. Sure, but also me, it might be why he went back to making, um, you know, his next film, Rabbi, was basically, I think it was a television film even, because it's only an hour long, and it's basically a kid's film about, you know, rebelling against parents and his pet tortoise, and then Bojan being a sequel to his first film, which is, again, much, yes. I guess, safer subject matter to be filming. Yeah, that's very true. Maybe he got a similar talking to as the, the journalist in, uh, in Samboko. It's possible. It's very possible. And I think with Zamboko as well, it touches again on that sort of urbanization, that rapid urbanization outside of with the capital, Ouagadougou. And I think it's something that is especially pertinent today, not just in Africa, but in other countries as well, where there's this rapid urbanization and there's not necessarily the proper infrastructure in place or bureaucracy and or a lot of, or respect and a lot of corruption does take place. But I also think that Zamboko took it from an inter interesting perspective. I think the English alternative name for the film is Homeland. And it's essentially, it's not just about, you know, a city growing and more people moving to the city and looking for places to live. But it's also, of, you know, this village that, you know, is just a rural village and the city is getting closer and closer. And that's not even, not often something you see on film mm whether from Africa or elsewhere, but it's something that's happened. You know, these small villages and towns get swallowed up in the big city and the suburbs over time. And it definitely does have changed the lives of these people who have been living their lives a certain way for generations in the same place. And to have it all ended just because the city is expanding its borders. I think it's a very fascinating subject matter. And that the way that Cabaret explored it, especially with the language factor of the more urbanites speaking almost exclusively French, and then the more rural people speaking more indigenous languages, I think primarily Moray or Mossi. There might have been some Dula as well. And I think that really played into it as well, because French was seen as the more sophisticated, the more educated language of the people who are more worth than having the money, even though it's the language of the colonizer. Anyway, it's probably more than enough to talk about Zen Boko, but I think it was a very intriguing film. It, it is, and it is, there's more to discuss about it too, even because it, it, the people aren't, like the people in charge and, and the rich people, they aren't even portrayed necessarily as evil. 
They might be snobby, they might be corrupt, but they're not overtly terrible. Like you have the family life of uh, the rich man moving in, and he just he just mostly just wants to, to get the guy next door out because he wants a swimming pool. Like he doesn't hate him, he doesn't want to crush him, he just wants a swimming pool, and he doesn't even uh, know quite who he is. Like he just gets his servant to do everything for him, and all of these comments on like you have his servant as a relatively notable character too is kind of this this beaten down guy who does everything he says and just this kind of almost point by point procedural uh, like when you first see okay now they're numbering their houses because the city is coming closer now we're moving to the city now we're following a journalist now we're uh, with the rich people now we're with the farmers like, you, you have these different little stages of the film to kind of, like, create a big picture of what's going on. And I wouldn't say it, it's not venomous, but it, it's certainly very critical and pointed. And, uh, yeah, it, it does just have a, have a lot of power and a lot going for it. Yes, and I think that might be why it resonates around the world, because it, for me, it's that sense of entitlement of the rich that that translates to any society, I think. And you always want to root for the underdog. And I think that's part of why this film, at least with me for me, uh, was a success. And having spoken a decent bit about Kabore, I think it m- makes sense to go directly to his, not sure if you can call it competitor, but his, the other big name from Burkinabe cinema, Idrissa Wadrago, uh, or Audrago. Again, the name I'm sure we're butchering uh, completely. He made a lot more films than Kabore. He was active for a lot, for actually for more or less a similar period of time. He started later, finished later, and tragically he's already dead. He died at the young age of 64 in 2018. But even then, like Kabore, he hadn't made a film for well over a decade so there's there's certainly something a little bit off when the two biggest directors just they're alive they're young but they're not making films so that that's certainly off but he made a lot of films that have gotten festival exposure in the west uh, i mean yamdabo yaba tilai uh sambatarua uh, Kini and uh, Adams, like there's so many films he did that were seen in France and, and across the world. And, and I know we disagree a little bit on his first film, which is actually a little bit similar to Samboku in a way in subject matter, uh, Yam Dabu or uh, The Choice. Uh, what's your thoughts about that film? This is one of the films that I saw in the past week, and I just, I just liked it. It was nice. Mm. I don't know what it was about it that really just it sat with me. It was a decent film. I understood what it was trying to say. I think not so much with the acting. I mean, it, it wasn't that great, but it just also the storyline itself just kind of felt stilted and it didn't really flow for me and feel connected. I still liked it better than To Lie. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, we're going to clash on that one for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a fan of To Lie or The Law, which is, is among my least favorite Nakabe films that I've seen. <laughs> Uh, sorry, not sorry. Yeah, that's um, fine. And that was another film that I saw a few years ago, and I had no desire to revisit it. And that one just was mediocre, in my opinion. It felt rushed. The ending was probably the best part, even though I didn't like the ending. I still understood why that ending was put there. But it just, no. If I've only seen three Madrogo films, and my best one would be Yaba which I think is also known as Grandmother. That's the one that I liked the most, and it's uh, one of my favorite Burkinabe films, for sure. Yeah, I actually agree with you on the choice. That's my... <laughs> a, a rare agreement we have. <laughs> yes, a, a rare agreement. in that. Well, actually, I might like it slightly less than you, but that's, it was quite stilted for me as well. I mean, it was Wadrago's first film. It makes sense that it was a bit stiff around the edges. But the, 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 just the transformation between that film and Yaba is huge. Uh, I mean, Yaba, and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed you actually liked Yaba that much. Not impressed, that's probably the wrong word, but given what you said earlier about child actors, because... I am this- too, but, um, you know, my notes and my ratings, like the acting, <laughs> I thought I quite liked. And then maybe it was just hmm. he found the right kids to fit the right roles. But I think also a lot of it depended on that grandmother figure. And I think yes. she really 
anchored the film quite quite well that maybe I was more forgiving of everyone else around her just because I thought that she was so great. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I completely I, I agree there as well. Um, I don't recall who played uh, the, the grandmother character who is not actually a grandmother. She's kind of this old woman who's assumed to be a witch. People don't trust her. Uh, they look at her the wrong way, but this young boy, he kind of forms a bond with her. It, a kind of trope we've seen uh, throughout a lot of cinema history, where, you know, this innocence of children recognizes the good in people. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a very sweet relationship. And I think that that woman has such charisma and uh, it, it just creates so much empathy with us. And it, it's like a lot of films from Rikina Falso, there is this slight brutality in the messaging you can say where it's it, it's you know very clear that you know should, <laughs> where your empathy should lie uh that it's you know with this woman who's being just accused of witchcraft and uh, uh like it, it has a bit of a mess very clear message of inclusivity but it's it's done in a very very beautiful way yes uh, i've just looked it up in the actress playing the grandmother slash witch is fatimata sanga for those who wanted to know Yes, thank you. And uh, Fatima uh, Tanga uh, certainly uh, deserves a lot of credit. I mean, she carries the film. There's two young child actors involved as well, this kind of semi-romantic boy-girl, you know, cuteness going in the background. Uh, that's probably the, the part, portion of the film I like less, but it, it all works together. And it's a very, very good film. But for me, the highlight of Rodrigo's career has to be the film you hate the most. <laughs> to lie. I don't hate it. Let's be clear. I don't hate it. It just... Okay, good. It just didn't really do any, anything for me. And I don't know if it's his best film, because even if you look at his at IMDb ratings, um, Yaba has a higher rating and has more people who have seen the film. So for me, that's the clear consensus winner there, if just slightly. So the law did win the Jury Grand Prize at the, the Cannes Film Festival, so it has that to brag about. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I were to recommend one Wedrogo film to people, I would recommend that they watch Yam Dabo as opposed to Talai, unless they were very into African folklore, because I think it is a very good exposure to the rest of the world of the types of stories that are told in an African folklore that have been put on screen. And I do think that aspect of it was interesting. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, for sure. Um, since you don't like it, I guess you can talk a little bit about why I like the law <laughs> so much. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I mean, it, it plays out a bit like a uh, Greek tragedy of sorts, if you will, or just any kind of large, grand tragedy. I mean, it's not a very long film. I think it's only 78 minutes long. But as with so many films from Burkina Faso, you have this old clay village, which is showcased beautifully. You have uh, non-trained actors presenting things very purely, but it's set in pre-colonial times. It, it, it gives it a bit of an epic, fable-like mysticism, if you will, that's just very beautiful it's quite stripped bare and the landscape is just stunningly stunningly shot and it, it has so much stuff going for it uh, you, you have the this kind of central idea of the law this kind of subtle critique of traditional society if you will uh where th this man saga comes home he realizes his father has wed his fiancee and he essentially revolts. And it follows these characters uh, on how they respond to that. They follow Saga and his his ex-fiancé, who still love each other and have feelings for each other. You, you follow his father, his mother, his brother, who's kind of put in between. You follow the sister of uh, his fiancé, who's one of the best characters in the film. Uh, and it's kind of from, I guess, from the mouth of children, if you will, but kind of speaks against traditional society, questions, traditions. I mean, she's a remarkably modern character. She's almost like the audience stand-in, in a way. But the whole film, you have the grand epic scope. You have the 
beauty and serenity of the visuals. You have the tragedy, you have the emotions, and you have this balance between traditions and morality, and just this conflict between the brothers, which results in even more tragedy. I just think it's just such a beautiful viewing. And anyone, I would say, who likes more stripped back, minimalist films, who, who maybe likes uh, likes it a lot when you know the Greek do their own Greek tra- uh, tragedies, which there are some really great examples of. I think those kind of viewers would absolutely love the law. It's interesting that you invoke Greek tragedies because I can see that now. And listening to you talk about it, it does kind of make me want to revisit the film and see if maybe I would enjoy it more uh, a second time around. But I have not had much success with uh, stylized Greek tragedy films. So maybe that's another reason why I didn't quite enjoy this. It just, I've seen Electra, I've seen uh, Antigone, and those, I just did not respond well to those films. So maybe that's why I didn't respond. To yes, films. I mean, I love those films, actually. So. <laughs> But that's probably the slight disconnect. So if anyone's like me, go go uh, watch The Law. Anyone who's like Brett, go watch uh, Grandmother. And uh, both of either one should be you should be pleased. Agreed. And uh, Udragi did go on to create some more films, and he had um, an interesting career. I don't have you seen any of his later films, Brett? No, I have not. I didn't get around to any of them. I do have access to Samba Traore and Kinney and Adams, but mm-hmm. um, I prioritize other films in this past few weeks instead of those ones, because I wanted to spread out the directors that I was watching. Yeah, yeah, it makes complete sense. And also, I mean, these films are not his his biggest at all. I mean, his biggest are probably his big three, especially Yaba and uh, The Law. Though uh, Samba Traore is interesting uh, because it's I think the first one of, well, it's not the first one, but it's, it's a film that's more set in modern society. So he kind of takes his ideas further. He had this little TV movie called Karim and Sala, which, uh, had the same child actors from Yaba, uh, return together as a romantic couple, uh, when they're slightly older. Oh, no way. Uh, it's not the same characters, but it's kind of, uh, it's set in uh, modern era, but it's it's quite an interesting choice. And it, it's quite cute. It, it's not. It was made for TV, and it's it's wouldn't say it's anything too special, but it's it's a very cute story with some nice touches and comments on poverty. And it's one that's ironically, since it's made for TV, it actually shows the city, which is not something I think any of his other films actually do. Because even Samba Trua, even though it's set in modern day, we kind of go immediately to this village uh, again. And then you had the harsh cry which uh, was set in France, which is, an, uh, in, like, his, essentially, it could have broken into French cinema there. It, it's still about working out with characters in France and this kind of this being torn away from their homeland and their effects on the child. Uh, this one I didn't feel that strongly about. And then he also did Anger of the Gods, which is actually my second favorite film of his. I would not recommend it to you, Brett, because it's another one of these kind of uh, large tragedies. It spans about 35 years, essentially from the ascent to the throne by a king who goes against his tradition, uh, this curse on him, uh, him stealing a bride, uh, the bride having a child by another man, and then following that child into adulthood. It's again like one of these kind of Greek tragedies. It's very stilted. The acting is once again, very earnest and non-prof- non-professional by many of them, uh, which can be a little bit jarring at times, but it's just was stripped back and tragic enough as a performance to really work for me. But uh, seeing how I reacted to the law and the Greek tragedies, I will not <laughs> recommend it. Who knows? Maybe I'll still end up giving it a go. Um even though I was very focused on Burkinabe films this past week and a half, I do intend to continue to explore their films in the coming years, and so I'll probably get around to a couple more next year, and maybe that will be one of them. And, and of course, uh, these directors are not the only directors who were working during the uh, 80s and 90s. I, I think you had some words to say about the films of Danny Piotte, He's not a director that I've found any films I love so far, but he's certainly a talented director. I mean, what is about his films that you enjoy the most, Brett? So I 
didn't see any new films. Uh, I had planned to, but I just didn't get around to it. And I was really looking forward to seeing Keita, which is one of his films. I think it might be even his best regarded film, perhaps. So that's high on my watch list. I've only seen Keita and Sia. Sia, thank you. That's the one. Yes. Um, Sia, Dream of the Python. That was another World Cup film, and I really liked it. I really liked the story. Uh, I was invested in it. I was rooting for the the main character, um, and I just I wanted to see it, and it, it just engaged me throughout. And it's um, especially with my earlier watches with with a lot of African films, I just found my engagement was like waning in and out, drifting in and out. But this one, I was fully committed the whole time, and I, I think this is one of the better films. And it's based on a Burkinabe legend. And this film, actually, I believe my information is correct. It, it's uh, in the Bambara language, as opposed to uh, Masai or Mori or Jula. I think that's another interesting point of, of Burkinabe cinema is that they do have so many indigenous uh, ethnic groups and, with their own main languages that you can see something different or you can have a lot of interplay amongst the characters because they do or don't speak the same language. But I really I really liked Sienna. I would definitely recommend that one to other people. Um, Keita... I'm interested in seeing. I do want to see that one. Um, haven't gone around to it. And then I, the other film by Kriatic that I was hoping to get to but didn't is Waga Saga, which is more of a comedy, which you don't see so much from these African films that get promoted in the West. They usually promote these dour stories or historical epics and such. So I kind of wanted to see this, you know, ensemble comedy and how that would look like, but I just didn't get a, get the chance to get around to it. Yeah, that film has not even been on my radar, so I should definitely uh, try to give that one a look. I, I, I quite like to see it too. I, it's been a while since I saw it, so I don't feel like I should comment too much about it, but it's it was a little bit rough around the edges, but the story and the drama and the lead character especially was really engaging, so I was pulled along there too. And in terms of Kita, it's it's also an interesting film, uh, and one of those other uh, films from Burkina Faso that kind of questions or kind of contrast modern life with tradition that you bring they bring this tradition of the griot which is storyteller who kind of belongs to this tribe and goes to visit the child of his old master and that that man is now you know living a modern life with his own family in a, in a modern house and uh, there's this interesting contrast between tradition and this young boy who doesn't really know anything of it and his fascination with the stories so i didn't love it but i could see you being moved by it for sure yeah i'm intrigued by it i don't know how well it's going to turn out but it's definitely something i i'm looking forward to seeing and i think he's the only other director from burkina faso that's really sort of built up a bit of a reputation though i wouldn't say he's nearly at the level of acclaim as Wadrogo or Kabore, but I don't think there's been any other director that's really made a name for themselves in Burkina Faso. I know that uh, Semben, um, however you say it, from Senegal, made a film set in Burkina Faso, again in the Bambar language, called Moula Day, which is absolutely probably my favorite Senegalese film. And then you also have Med Hondo, the Mauritanian French director who made a film that I think you quite enjoyed, Saraunia, if you want to introduce that one. Yeah, sure. That's another one of those films that we are going to disagree on quite a bit. Um, I, I think what I can say about Saraunia that kind of separates it just from everything else here is that I'm not really sure if it necessarily is fully from Burkina Faso. It has a Mauritanian director. It has uh, Mauritanian money involved. But, but counting it as a Burkina Faso film, as it often is, it, it's just on a different scale. I mean, this was made in 1986. So that's four years after Van Cuny. It's one year before Udrago's first film, uh, The Choice. And the scale of this film, the difference in looks, I mean, it, it's just, Re- remarkable. It's, uh, for, for people who are used to seeing the films of Idrissa Odrago and Gaston Cabore, uh, you have these very simple compositions. Here you have widescreen 
you have large battles, you have large groups in choreography, you travel the world, you have scenes in Egypt, you have scenes with different groups building this large map of what's happening uh, around us. It's just epic in a way that you don't associate with this country. I don't think there's been any film from uh, Burkina Faso made uh, since that has been just at this scope. So that's just remarkable in itself. This film is from 1986. It's nearing 40 years old and it's just a shame that no director from Burkina Faso has been allowed this kind of budget or scope since. It's almost mind-boggling that it hasn't happened. I think it's an impressive feat on its own, as you mentioned, but it just didn't connect with me. Um, I do think it is an interesting case of co-productions, as you mentioned, has a lot of Mauritanian influence. There's a lot of French funding behind it. It's a Nigerian story, essentially, covering a few you know, parts of the continent that's now part of Niger, Nigeria, Benin, Burkina Faso. It was filmed in Burkina Faso. So it's, it is very much a West African film as opposed to a strictly Burkinabe film. But I just felt the story was all over the place. Mm. It didn't really let me get invested with any of the characters that was going on. And I was surprised in that it's the narrative structure of the film seemed strongest when it was talking about the white people, which is not quite what I had expected from a sub-Saharan African film. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't paint them in a good light at all. And I, it's historical film. I don't know how much of it is actual fact, but it is based on actual events, mm. which I did find interesting because it, it's a tragic yet fascinating period of history, in my opinion. But it just it just didn't feel cohesive enough to make me care what was happening to the people. But I thought it was well shot. The cinematography was quite nice. I just wish it had more heft and soul behind it. And I mean, that's just my perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I completely see that. I think that's actually part of its issue. It's part of its strength as well. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. Just to present the overall story and what, what this film is about. It's set in the late 19th century, essentially at, at, uh, at, it's set in 1899. It presents itself to be about Sarunia, a witch queen leading her own people. And for the first 20 or so minutes, we follow her from childhood into adulthood. And we see a very modern portrayal. I mean, this is a woman who can choose her own lovers, has very modern attitude, has a lot of strength. But then we suddenly move away from her. And for the next 30 or so minutes, we focus on various characters. We focus on different towns in the area and their feelings about Sarunia. Uh, the, the stories that uh, the whites are going to invade. We follow the whites and the, uh, the, their quite brutal conquering of uh, mostly peaceful villages. We even uh, we even visit the Egypt where, as I mentioned earlier, where we see the emir actually plot against her just because they had lost battles to her before and siding with the French people who are coming to invade. It has an epic scope. I completely understand why as someone who would be going in there looking for, you know, um, kind of characters to drive the story would be put uh, a little bit off because it, it's kind of like this, almost this large vignette of the entire area at the time with so many different characters, so many different peoples and really telling an overall story of, I guess the message could be about all of Africa coming together and standing together that's kind of the note it's working towards but Sarunia is kind of disappears in the story even though she shows up throughout and is a strong character and like you said it's the white people the French the conquerors that are given a lot of the screen time and that's one of the things that's most fascinating to me because we often Talk about or read about, write about, uh, not sure if we do specifically, but if you, if you read, if you read writings on representation, you often write, you often read about how black people in stories seen from the West are often 
quite one dimensional characters or especially in the past, you know, think about something like Sulu, uh, for instance. Like you have these, these kind of opponent characters who are given screen time, but they're not really uh, developed. And it's, it's always interesting to see that from the other side. There's a few examples from Africa where you have white lead characters, like the great white from the bar, I think is called, which kind of feels alienating as a viewer if you, if you meant to kind of sympathize specifically with that character. So that's, it's really interesting to see the film through that. Through that lens. But what I will say is that the focus on the whites, like you say, it's, they're not positively portrayed. They are this kind of terrifying force of just brutality, uh, mass murder, cruelty. And they kind of go down this almost Aguirre style, uh, trip into madness and make, uh, uh, mania. And, one of the, I realize I've been talking for a long time, so I'll give it back to you. One of the things that it's kind of the most interesting to this film uh, to me is that Sarunia is meant to be this witch queen, and the film never actually shows anything overtly magical happening except someone kind of seeing an apparition in front of them at one point. But there's kind of this implication that as we follow the white people, that she has hexed them. You get the fire, you get the lightning storm, you get the uh, captain's increasing madness. You kind of feel like all of these things you're following are her doing. That that part and that reading is very, very interesting. As you know, everyone starts becoming more and more scared uh, of what's happening. You see the captain becoming more and more mad and you're just wondering, like, is this her power, if you will? And it, it's it's a very interesting way to tell a story. That's interesting that you mentioned that because that completely went over my head. I didn't pick up on any fantastical elements or didn't even think of her hexing them. Like it just, it completely passed me by. It also could have been that I was just kind of not fully paying attention by that point because I wasn't holding my interest, but that's, <laughs> that's something I didn't, I didn't think of. So that's an interesting take on it. And I'm, I'm curious now if, if I missed that or if it's just, one way to interpret the the historical record. Yeah, I mean, it could just be my random interpretation as well. Maybe no one agrees with me. I'm reading more things into this film than, <laughs> than I should. But yeah, and also there's a shout out for Matt Hondo. I mean, he's, uh, in my opinion, a just terribly great director, one of the best from Africa. He's a bit of a nomad director. He did Ozolail in France. Uh, and then he did West Indies in his native Mauritania. West Indies is one of my favorite films is a bit of a dog will before dog will but set on a slave ship and cap which is meant to represent both the slave ship and the country where the slaves are taken from so that's just a really powerful viewing for anyone who's interested in that but with uh, Sarunia out of the way uh, I think we're ready to move on to the 21st century or do you have anything else to add about the 20th century Brett? No, I think that's all that I wanted to say about the 20th century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all, the all the 20th century has now been summed up. I mean, I know we both, watched, <laughs> we both watched Laffy, I think, but we weren't that impressed. No, I didn't see, I didn't see Laffy yet. No, it was on my radar because it is one of the films. And that's, that's another thing too, is that Burkina Faso was one of the few African films that did submit a list of films to be preserved for the UNESCO Cinema Cinema of the World Project or Memory of the World Cinema Project. And so Laffy is one of the films that was on that. So it is in my radar, but you didn't have so great of a response to it. So I decided not to prioritize it. <laughs> I mean, we do disagree on almost everything in this episode. Well, not everything, but we have disagreed on uh, these my two favorites so far. So <laughs> True, but I wanted to get some 21st century viewing in uh, to cover more of the time scope. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. M maybe we can start by just looking at the films of, I guess, the early uh, serials first, because we both saw two quite interesting films this, this last week. Yeah, I think we both saw the same film. So the one I liked was Night of Truth, and the one that you liked was Dreams of Dust. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Once again, a disagreement. But uh, since The Night of Truth was the first one of these, uh, we can probably start with that one. And uh, feel free to present away, Brett. Awesome. So yeah, Night of Truth, La Nuit de la Verité, is the one that just completely blew me away. 
I favorited the film, which is not something that often happens on first viewing for me. And it's the only film from Burkina Faso I've seen so far from a female director. There are a couple of films from Apolline Traoré, Bor uh, Frontier and Desgrance, from past years, but I haven't gotten around to them yet. Sometimes I'll read the synopsis before watching. Sometimes I'll just go straight into it blind. This one I happened to go into blind. And just within the first 10 minutes, it was so different from any of the other Burkina Faso films that I'd seen recently or earlier that I had to pause and just go and read a, a synopsis. Like, what am I getting myself into? Because it was just so viscerally different. It was set in modern times. It was in a fictional country that I read online is sort of potentially taken as a stand-in for Rwanda and that ethnic conflict that took place between the Tutsis and the Hutus. And here it's these two ethnic groups, the Zakars and the Banandes, I think they're called. I forget what they're they're called. Just two fictional ethnic groups. And I think they're mostly speaking the same indigenous language, Jula. Um, I don't know if that's intentional or if maybe one of the other groups is is speaking a different language. They didn't really make that clear in the film. And I wish in any film where there's more than one language being spoken that they do different colors for different languages in the subtitles. Uh, it's a, a constant pet peeve of mine. And I just saw Black Panther Wakanda Forever recently in cinemas. And there they actually did that for dialogue that was spoken in Wakandan. It was in orange. And for dialogue spoken in Mayan, it was aqua and then dialogue that was spoken in french or spanish it was white in the subtitles and it was so much easier to follow who spoke which language and who understood each other anyway sorry minor minor tangent that would actually be very useful if everyone did that <laughs> uh, but i also have to like i have to to the fact that you know with with african and burkinabe films in general they don't get the widespread distribution they don't get the funding behind them they don't like some of these films that most of these films are not widely available at all. You might find a few on YouTube. You'll rarely find any of them on the streaming services. You do kind of have to go into the different corners of the web or specialty purveyors to find these films either online or through media. But even then, finding a hard copy of these films on DVD is, is hard. Some of them don't exist on DVD. They were only released in VHS or through, I think it's. Yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's the sad thing about so much of this. Like, th there is no market for it. So if they were released on DVD in the 2000s, they're not coming back on Blu-ray. Uh, they're not getting the restoration. Uh, same with the VHSs. I mean, I mean, there was some pushes with VHS. I don't remember through who back in the 2000s and 90s as well, but the distribution is just so poor for these films. It, it's quite sad. Yeah, I think one company, it's California Newsreel. They've put out a number of African films, but again, it's, it's low quality VHS, essentially. So it's just, I can't complain that they don't do these, you know, different color subtitles because they don't have the budget for it. And there's, I know there's not enough interest in African cinema in general from the Western world to warrant this, which is just really unfortunate because they've got some great films like, Night of Truth, getting back to the film at hand. But yeah, so this film, it's set in modern times in an undisclosed region of West Africa with two competing ethnic groups who have been at civil war for, I think it was about 10 years. It's a significant period of time. I think it's about 10 years based on one of the comments where a mother tells a child that they've been fighting since before he was born and he looks to be about 8 to 10 years old. And they're trying to broker a peace deal between the two factions, one side led by the president of the country, the other side led by the general of the army. And most of this film takes place, I think it's over the course of one day or one night, with a few flashbacks of them coming together to talk peace. And I just, the story blows away, blew away. the acting was quite good. Again, not great as the trend we've seen. But I absolutely did not care because like the cinematography, like every different aspect of how this story was told was so intentional and it was so perfect. Like it just, oh, it just struck for me. And I, I wish I could be more articulate instead of just being this fanboy moment. But I just found it really interesting how they were able to get across each different perspective, whether it was right or wrong. They had so many different characters, but you never lost sense of who was who or which side they were on. The way that the cinematography was shown, I thought was very expressive 
of getting the different points of view on. It was very graphic at points, which I did not expect. You some very realistic corpses. No, no graphic violence. I don't do well, deal well with that at all. It was just sort of the aftermath of the violence that was quite graphic, which shocked me at first because I'm not used to seeing that in films from this region, at least, especially not from old, the older films that I'd seen. So it really just sort of made me sit up and take note. And I was just really drawn in by the story and the different interweaving connectivities between the different characters and sort of the gray area of who's morally got the high ground and who doesn't or does anybody and how the film dealt with various emotions of grief and of guilt and of retribution and revenge and wanting justice done and yet still wanting to make peace like it just it was just a very well done film and the director Fanta Regina Nacro this was her first feature film uh, she made a bunch of short films I think three or four before that that I want to see if I can locate anywhere and just sort of see what else she's put out there but this was just such a positive film going experience for me even if it's relative like it's a negative tone film <laughs> and it's definitely one of the best films I've seen this year by far so I think it's interesting to also note that Fanta Regina Nakhlov was the first woman to ever direct a feature film in Burkina Faso. And from what I can see, she hasn't made anything since, uh, unless that films that haven't been added and distributed uh, to the point that they've been added to IMDb or and Wikipedia. So Yeah, I was looking at some French language sources, because the, um, the ones in French tend to have more information about All Burkina Faso right, films. And I did see some additional credits by her name. They might oh, just be right. short films or TV stuff. Mm. I didn't see anything feature length. Mm. Um, but yeah, for her and other directors that we have and we'll discuss, um, IMDb unfortunately does not tell the whole story of their cinematic career. Yeah, it's, it's quite tragic. And obviously the distribution doesn't tell the story either. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're just trying to uh, say, spare our feelings a bit that we can't see these films. Um, but yeah, no, I, I actually quite like The Night of Truth uh, as well. It's, it's a terribly good film. It's a harsh film. Like you said, the harsh of violence and the way it looks at grief is really, uh, it's just really strong. It, there's some very memorable images in there. And like you, I really enjoyed the way they kept both sides in a, in a light that was good and bad. Uh, both sides had done terrible terrible things uh, but both sides also had our sympathies to one point or another even as we learned more about their depravities I, I think it's also it's a really good job in just showcasing strong women characters like the wives of the president and the, and the colonel they, they are probably the most notable character especially the wife of the president who's kind of slowly becomes this kind of very unhinged dangerous character that could explode at any moment but also the wife of the colonel who is trying to essentially keep everything together like there's this tension throughout the entire night like yes, will they be absolutely that's another like i was tense and it and it kept up that tension throughout the entire film which is so rare for a film like it just it kept it up and i Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, yes. No, 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 yes. <laughs> I, I love the passion because that's one of the things it does best too. Like, you, you get these two warring clans and both of them are on the edge. Both of them are thinking of this. Do you think at any point any of these people can just pull out the gun and start shooting the others? You see their, you know, essentially their trauma, their pain of their dead. They're either infighting, like people recognizing people who had, uh, has hurt them specifically in the past. Like it's, it's it's like a bit of a not just a night of truth, but a nightmare of truth, if if you will. And that's it, it ends with some really striking, terrible imagery uh, and some interesting messaging. So it's it's a very powerful viewing. The only thing really missing for me uh, is that it was I felt it was a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, like, you know, I'm a very visual person, so if this was shot like uh, Zerunia, I'd probably be loving this completely. <laughs> but no, the for more me, digit, yeah. Yeah, for me, that didn't bother me at all. I was so mm. drawn in by the story that minor imperfections with the scenography did not affect me at all. And I do want to rewatch this film, even though I'd just seen it <laughs> two mm. days ago. 
And part of the reason why I didn't enjoy it is because it kept that tension the whole time up. And now yeah, that I yeah. know the whole story, I'm wondering if upon rewatch, if that tension's going to maintain itself or if I'm not going to be as interested because I kind of already know, or if I'm going to pick up on other things that I didn't notice the first time. Now that I've got the full picture, I'm like, oh, I can see they're laying the groundwork for this story there and yeah, that story yeah. there. Because you they slowly reveal things not just to the characters, but to the audience mm. as well over time. I thought it was really well done. But also I thought they, some of the subtler touches, like the, I guess not national dishes, but like the the dishes associated with the different ethnic groups. One of them, a delicacy for them is snake. The other one, a delicacy for them is, is you know, fried caterpillars. And just the way that that was worked into it. And so that it just, I don't know, it was just excellent storytelling in general. Yeah, and if I was gonna say anyone to watch any of the films we discussed today, <laughs> this is the film that I want people to see. Yeah, and just a disclaimer for myself too. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a detached viewer, and I enjoy cinema that is a bit detached, uh, like me. So I think that there, there is strength in not overcomposing. I think that you can get a lot closer to the characters and feel things in a different way if you're not focusing on the visuals. So I, I think this is definitely a film that. Uh, has a lot of power and possibility to just get a lot of fans if it just gets the exposure it it truly truly deserves. But to move on to the film, I like that in the film that I guess I, to spoil it is a bit more visually composed and a bit <laughs> a bit more poetic, restrained, uh, just generally uh, beautiful to me at least is Dreams of Dust from two thousand and six. And uh, again, just as with A Night of Truth, there's a bit of, uh, and uh, Sarunia, uh, and some other films you might talk about later, there's a bit of internationality here because uh, the, the lead character is not from Burkina Faso. Uh, he is from Niger, and, and some people call him a Nigerian. Maybe it's the bad subtitling. Uh, no, or, that's, or maybe... <laughs> that's correct. So Nigerian, as we think of, is N-I-G-E-R-I-A-N mm. for people mm. from Nigeria. But Nigerian, N-I-G-E-R-I-E-N, is for people from Niger or Niger or however you say that All country. Right, so very good. that's yeah. the differentiation between the two. Maybe my subtitles were bad and they, they misspelled the Nigerian with Nigerian. Or maybe I just misread completely. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but it, it's one of those stories that fits quite well with what uh, Burkina Faso has put out before in uh, sparse desert settings, poor characters. But but it has a different flair. We essentially follow an almost desolate uh, gold mine expedition, if you will. Like there was gold there once. It's there's not really much there anymore, and it just have so many poor people coming from around Africa to work there and desperately try to find gold while being overseen by you know these people who just were this one specific character who just sits there uh, fanning himself and shouting out orders. And it captures the dust beautifully, the desert beautifully. It has these almost poetic characters who you don't quite know what they're really searching for. And there's a lot to read into the film and feel about this film. It, it's striking. It's just, it's just a piece of this experience in the sense of this almost futile endeavor of finding gold and all of the danger uh, involved in it. And it, it's just told beautifully well. Yeah, I didn't enjoy this film as much as you did. I do agree that the cinematography is quite good. That this sort of yellow tinted film, all natural. Like it's not the film that's tinted, but just the landscape is just so yellow with the dust. And it's not gold dust, it's just regular dust. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it was filmed actually at the site of the Ekadan or Esedan gold mine in northeastern Burkina Faso. And. It's interesting because this film is actually directed by a Frenchman who I believe he's married to the lead actress. So it's it does have a lot of French funding as a result, but I would still consider this a, a Burkinabe film because he, as far as I know, he lives there um, and he's, he's integrated himself into the film. And it's kind of interesting because he kind of has this outsider perspective similar to the main character, even though he's coming from a different country. And then one of the other characters is from Mali, I believe he says. And it's all these people from around the region who are just looking to get by at this old mine. I was kind of bored, to be honest. And I was, like, the first 20 minutes or so really dragged out. I mean, nothing really happens for the first three minutes. 
I accept credits and no dialogue, and you're just like, okay, so why am I watching this? <laughs> What's going to happen? But then I slowly did get drawn into it, and as slow as the film is, it did kind of just fly by. And I remember at one point I was just checking to see how much time was left, and it's like, oh, there's only 15 minutes left. Like it, it's gone by quickly, and it's not a long film. It's only about 80 minutes. But I just I didn't feel like it developed the characters enough. And one thing that really bothered me was you have this man who is facing personal tragedy back home. That's part of the reason why he's left. And it's his first day. And within, you know, 48 hours of his arrival at this place, he's already hitting on a woman and trying to get to know her and, and, and buying her things. And I'm just like, dude, you have virtually no money left. You, <laughs> you've injured yourself on the first day of job. And you can't pay the doctor, and you're already trying to hit on this woman. Priorities, like it just, it didn't. The tone of it didn't make sense and didn't fit for me with what the film was trying to portray. And I just that there was a disconnect for me of what what's going on. What is the director trying to to portray for us here? And I just it made it more difficult for me to get into the film because of that. But I did like, uh, and I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. There's one character whose name is Tiame. Am I pronouncing that right? Tiam, probably. It's Tiam. hard to say, yes. It yeah, Tiam. Tiam. Played by Rasmane Weidrogo, who's basically shown up in almost every single Brick and Abbey film. I, I was actually <laughs> going to dedicate a mini section to him because yeah. Yeah, he's in Night of Truth as well. He's the lead in uh, The Law. He's in several of uh, Idris Weidrogo's films. Uh, I'm not sure if they're related. I mean, it's the same last name, but it seems to be a common no, last it's, name it's as well. No, it's just a common last name in, in the region, yeah. So he, this is character, he plays a supporting character, and in the first half of the film, he's kind of like this older, maybe you could consider him like a foreman of the mining mm, site, yeah. sort of taking care of the other people, his crew underneath um, the boss, and then when the big boss decides that he's going back to the city of of Bobo Gilasso, he ends up taking over the mine and seeing his character transformation. And it's commented on in the film by the other characters as well. I think one of the lines is, I liked you better when you were poor. Um, <laughs> but I really like his character, I think was the only interesting character for me. And that's sort of that transformation of his personality. The protagonist was just kind of bland. His love yes. interest was kind of bland, mm. but they didn't do anything with, with the, the young girl. And then the other two workers, uh, the one guy was just kind of there and the one who didn't speak, I think he was the one who was from Mali. He had minimal character development as well. And I just, I felt like so much more could have been done with this story, mm. but the director, for whatever reason, opted for something very minimalist and very pretty. And I know that those are <laughs> the things that you like about that, film. That, yeah. Absolutely. To Chris. <laughs> and I think, you know, like it, this for me is like the textbook mm -hmm. definition of an art house film. And it just didn't speak to me and I didn't resonate with it, but I can definitely see this film doing well with Western audiences, especially oh, those yes, who yeah. are more interested in quote unquote art house fare. And I'm surprised it hasn't been more widely promoted considering hmm. it's not that old. It's only from 2006. No, no, no you're, you're completely right. I think this, this has a lot of potential with Western art house audiences. And I will also just completely agree with you that, you know, the character of, uh, Tiam, uh, portrayed by uh, Rasman Odrago, it's a great character. He starts off, he's pretty much, he acts like their father. He's such a caring, uh, caring person who's, when our lead character hurts himself, he follows him to the doctor. He helps him get like some extra, an extra little mini job for some income. He's there cooking, etc. And then when he gets, this role, he just slowly starts to distance himself and his demeanor slowly starts to change. And it's just this kind of drift of progression of things that's just really intriguing to see. In terms of the lead character, I think he's more blank than that he, there's nothing there. It's kind of like someone we can read more into. It's just a question of how well into that you are because like you said it, it's weird that he starts to kind of potentially flirt with this woman and not to spoil too much there but the relationship does end up being something slightly more platonic and it could be that he's in a non-creepy way more interested in her daughter due to some of his own past history but I, I will agree with you there that that, that, that scene in particular <laughs> the first or second day he's there can come off 
<laughs> uh, a, a bit off. Yeah, that's just maybe just my particular sensibilities. It's just no, no, that's it. It's a perfectly fair response. And now we also heard two films from uh, the mid zeros. Uh, one that really appealed to me. One that really appealed to to Brett. Uh, once again, you know, seek out the one you think is closer to your sensibilities. Yeah, they're both worthwhile. I would definitely say that they are both worth taking a look at. I, I haven't actually seen that many films made after 2006. So in fact, I'm checking now I've only seen two. I've seen Valet and Frontiers. I only saw Valet. I didn't get around to Frontier, unfortunately. So uh, they're both from 2017. So I guess I can just quickly summarize uh, Frontiers before we then go to uh, Valet, I, I suppose. Go for it. So Fr- Frontiers is actually a, a really interesting film. I think you'd really enjoy it, Brett. It's it's a little bit like The Night of Truth in that it's uh, it's a little bit digital. It's not the most beautiful film in the world, but it has a lot of great characters, uh, developments, dialogue. It's it's one of those rare bus movies, <laughs> which is it's like kind of like this subgenre. I'd almost like to cover on this this podcast it's because it, bus movies do not really get the exposure that train or plane movies uh, get. But what is interesting about it is that it's about all of these characters from completely different backgrounds and, and four women in particular who travel across Africa uh, border after border after border and like Samboko it is very overt in its critique of uh, bureaucracy and corruption everyone in this film is essentially corrupt, everyone's willing to bribe sleep around, everyone wants a bribe making up fake taxes there's problems at almost every single border and uh, it, it just this signaling of how dangerous uh, it is to actually travel just these roads, the straightforward true. Don't remember exactly where it starts at the moment. I know we go through we go through Mali, we go through Burkina Faso, Benin. Uh, they're, they're, they're heading towards Lago. I think that's their end destination. And you have characters from four different countries as well. You have Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and, and, a co- and two others, which I am blanking on at the moment. And just that these women from different cultures can bond, form a friendship, and, and there's the conversations between them on and off the bus and some more dramatic and terrible things that happen down the line. It's, it's a really intriguing film, and I, I can see why it got the focus it did. And of course, it's from one of the few women uh, who have been able to make films in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Apolina Traue. And that's more or less it about that film. Um, and we can go to the film we've actually both seen, uh, Valet. Do, do you want to introduce it, Brett? Sure. I saw both Dreams of Dust and Valet last night, so it's still fresh in my mind. And with this film, it's about a, I think he might be 12, 13. It's not really clear how old he is, but it's a 13 year old boy who lives in the south of France with his father. And I believe he has an older brother as well. And the opening 10 minutes or so just kind of shows him being this punk ass kid, (laughs) not really behaving, um, you know, goofing around with his friends, maybe, maybe not getting into petty crime. It's not really clear. Um, and disrespecting his father. And as a result, his father sends him to his, um, ancestral village in Burkina Faso for what the boy thinks is, you know, just a vacation to visit his grandmother and extended family, but in reality is just kind of a punishment for his bad deeds uh, for six months or so. I, I don't know if there's a given time <clears throat> frame of how long he's going to be there. And the boy doesn't know until after he gets there, and he's not he doesn't take too well to it. And it's just sort of this clash of cultures, because this boy, I think he's born in France, and so he's grown up in France and only speaks French, doesn't speak um Jula, I think, is the indigenous language featured in this film. Um, he doesn't speak the local language at all, so he can't even communicate with his grandmother because his grandmother doesn't speak French. Um, and it's just this very interesting, you know, fish out of water, coming of age kind of tale. And it's, it's an interesting for me because a lot of African cinema, especially in the early days, was these sort of rural coming of age tales. And this is a modern take on that. Where it's, you know, urban boy going to a rural village coming of age, but with all the modern, like he's got his Beats by Dre headphones and he's got his smartphone and he's got, you know, his, his fancy new sneakers. He just kind of has to fit into this 
small village has been thrust into against his will and just kind of figure it out. And that's the basic premise. I liked it. I, I was kind of iffy on it at first. And again, this is a film. This is made by a Swiss director, actually, Bernie Goldblatt. But I was reading up about him, and he's actually lived in Burkina Faso and decided to settle down there since the late 90s. And he's like the, the capital and the largest city by far is Ouagadougou in the center of the country. And that's where, you know, Zanboko takes place there. And a lot of these films kind of focus on that. But this film takes place in the region near to Bobo Dilasso, which is where Bernie actually lives. He, and he's, I think he's rebuilt a cinema in Bobo as well. It's referred to in Dreams of Dust that that's the city that the, um, the boss wants to go back to where he's from in the south of the country. So it's interesting to sort of see that regionalism call the play. And I think that might be why, you know, the earlier films that we saw from Cabaret and Bedrogo, if they weren't in French, they were usually in Mossi or Amore. And those are the films that I guess set more in the Ouagadougou part of the country, where these Jula ones are more in the south. Anyway, sorry, I'm all about these little information tidbits and tangents. My apologies. You can cut them out if you want. <laughs> uh, anyway, and I was reading another review that it, it was, they talked about how this film did a really good job at portraying the difficulties of these sort of bicultural or third culture kids, as they're sometimes known, who grow up in one country, but their parents and ancestors are from another country. And so they never f- truly fit in with either one. And, and in this film, some of the folks call him the little white boy because he is lighter skinned. So I don't know if that's assumed to mean that his mother was white or was of mixed race because he's noticeably lighter than all of the other characters who are, are rather dark. And he sort of teased for that, though I don't think he fully understands what's going on. And it's just sort of an interesting take of, you know, not knowing where your place is. And, and you're so used to living by a set of rules and cultural standards and norms and you're thrown into this other place where you're suddenly expected to live by their cultural standards and norms and the, it's kind of played up comically at the beginning it's like you know he needs more water for a shower you know there is no shower or but there's no power on during the day so you can't charge his <laughs> his iphone kind of thing overall i like the story i thought it was really well done i thought the lead character was quite good uh, for a child actor <laughs> and his sort of surrogate big brother while he's in burkina faso um is an actor whose name escapes me but he played the lead in another African film called Wulu, which I saw a few years ago and I quite liked. I think other people who have seen it have enjoyed it as well. So it was nice to see him pop up again. And then there is, without, I don't think I'm going to spoil the film, but if I start to say too much, please stop me or we can cut it out. That's all right. Um, part of the plot of the film revolves around him needing to pay back his uncle for money that he's stolen, which didn't mm-hmm. make sense to me because the way it's presented, is that his mother or his uncle was sending money from Burkina Faso to his brother, the kid's father, in mm-hmm. France by mail and by money order. It's like, wait, why is he sending money? Unless it was an issue with subtitles, and instead it was the money that was supposed to be sent from France back to yeah, Burkina I th- Faso. Yeah, that, that's how I got it. That it was the father uh, sending okay. money to the uncle. That makes more sense. Because I remember he's so confused. Like, why is he sending money to France? Usually it goes the other <laughs> way around. Like, this makes no sense to me. The thing I didn't get was how the kid managed to steal it. That was uh, the weird part to me. Yeah, because if it's money order, it's my, oh, you know what? It's because I have sent money overseas before. And typically how it goes is you take the cash with you, give them the cash, and that ter- converts into a money order, which then can be, then you take that money order to, the post office or whoever's trans- mm. dealing with that and they send that. So my guess is the father gave the cash to the kid. The mm. kid took some of it for his own purposes. And then the money order was just smaller. Yeah. yeah. It was just, it was just brought up so suddenly and without context that, and perhaps the subtitles weren't so clear mm. or I just wasn't following them that it just, it confused me and it really threw me for a loop. And I was like, well, no wonder the kid's saying he didn't do it. Like, it makes no sense. <laughs> but no, that's probably, it's it's just me. It's just me. Yeah, it, it, he does admit to it later, at least, because for a little while I wasn't even sure if it was true. I was wondering if it was something completely different going on. But, uh, but at least he does admit it later on in, in the film. Maybe we saw him take it and we just didn't realize because we didn't realize it was a money order earlier on and we should have paid more attention. Who knows? Yeah, it, it was just super weird. Maybe it's time to go back and watch it, even though I just saw it last night. <laughs> 
But then part of that deal of why he's there is, and it, it's not explicitly stated until that point, is that he needs to work off the debt he owes his uncle for the money that he stole, which is something like 500 euros, I think it was, which is a lot of money for a 13-year-old kid. And the wages in Burkina Faso, the standard wages, are not the same wages as you know what he'd earned uh, in France. And I think there was this very stark dichotomy between you know like childhood in France and childhood in Burkina Faso where you know kids are put to work and they're expected to work and it, he's just not willing to accept that at first yeah and then there's this whole subplot where his father his uncle because of a chicken knocking down a, a bar which is just one of the funniest parts of the film for me <laughs> his uncle accidentally walks in and while he's showering in the outdoor shower and notices that he's not circumcised. And that's a big thing because he has to be circumcised. And as soon as that subplot came up, I could start to feel in my blood boiling. So I was just like, oh, where is this film going? What's this film going to do? And so I was like getting rangy, getting ready to be all angry and all righteous about it, depending on how the film turned out. And I'm not going to tell you what happens. You're going to have to watch it to find out yourself. Um, but it did keep me engaged as well. And I, I was kind of surprised that the, the film decided to go that route and talk about that aspect of things but it, it's not a bad thing but i think the most endearing part of the film for me was the relationship that he forges with his grandmother they don't speak the same language she only speaks jula he only speaks french there is this village girl nearby who kind of informally acts as an interpreter between the two when his surrogate older brother or his uncle are not around and again, this other review that I was reading, they were talking about how a lot of the characters is just for this casual touch between them that maybe is something that's more common in, in Burkinabe and African culture as opposed to the West. Like the West, there's often like these personal space boundaries. Even when the kid is, you know, riding on the back of the motorcycle behind the big brother, he's got his arm on the other guy's waist and just to sort of make sure he doesn't fall off, which is for me, it's no big deal. But for a lot of, you know, guys like, no, you can't touch. You have to hold on the back because you can't have this any sort of perceived intimacy between two men, but then, you know, like he's holding his grandmother's hand and they're very connected or like he and the, the other young girl, they've, they have a budding puppy dog romance going on. They, you know, they touch hands at points. And it's interesting because this reviewer noticed this and sort of touched upon how these brief instances of physical touch between the characters added another layer to their relationships and I thought that was something really interesting to see expressed on screen as well. Yeah, a lot, a lot to dive into there for sure. I mean, I think that as soon as the circumcision storyline started uh, coming up, I started wondering, like, wait, wasn't this film in large part uh, sponsored by uh, the, the tourist agency of Burkina Faso? <laughs> <laughs> circumcision tourism! <laughs> because that was like the big logo I remember from the beginning. It's like, hmm, they're not selling it that well. But no, I, I think you're completely right that it, it's an interesting take on that traditional coming of age story that we saw in a lot of the uh, films from uh, from the 90s, but from a modern age. And I, I think it was a very nice balance uh, too. And once again, one of those themes we've seen throughout many of these films is new versus old. And there's this kind of dynamism between them. And uh, you, you kind of see the negative of both here you have this kid who is, you know, completely disconnected from his father. He doesn't obey. He's just a brat. And he could possibly be going down, like you said, a criminal path. We don't know, but that's kind of like at least the feeling you get from his father who's really worried about him. But then you also have this pressy regime from his uncle who doesn't really show him any respect. And this pushes, uh, pushes him around. And that conflict is interesting to watch. And as it co continues without spoiling too much... It does strike a little bit of a balance between between this as well. That was interesting to see. I think it's I mean, it's not one of my favorite films from Burkina Faso. It's a good film. Uh, it's a film with engaging characters, uh, good acting, and, and a decent, touching story. But it, it shows that Burkina Faso still has you know good films coming out. But it, but it's not a standout for me. And I I think it was good because a lot of these. African countries that had sort of this critical renaissance, or not renaissance, but critical glory in the 70s, 80s, and 90s have kind of diminished in their output in the 21st century. You know, like Senegal doesn't necessarily command the same attention as used to, though it's starting to come back, or like Cote d'Ivoire or Cameroon, um, mm. these countries that, you know, had a lot of critically acclaimed films earlier, but that kind of haven't really 
lived up to that reputation since then. So it's nice to see that after a bit of a lull, Burkinabe films seem to be coming back and seem to be getting more funding and more training. And you can see this like part of what Bernie Goldblatt, the director of Wale, does is like he also works in the local community and I think he teaches as well now, aside from just directing. So it's nice to see these. And this is also why I wanted to make sure when I was prioritizing the films that I was watching, I was trying to get them from different decades to sort of see how to like construct this narrative of the history of Burkinabe cinema and sort of where it's headed. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, it really feels like there's been a bit of a shift uh, with African cinema where uh, different countries are suddenly on top. Like suddenly Kenya, for instance, is a very big and important uh, country. Yes. It, it's, a, it's an odd shift. You, you would have thought that once you actually have established uh, a trend, you have connections with the industry, uh, that that would continue to one extent or another. Uh, so hopefully, you know, Burkina Faso manages to step up. I have big hopes, at least for Apolline Trore, to see like what, what she might do in the future. What kind, because she seems to actually be, still be able to make films. She's made one more film since. Yeah, Derance. Yes, exactly. So she's, uh, that was 2019. Hopefully she continues to make films and she doesn't just disappear like so many of the other directors from this country. But yeah, let, let, let's see. I mean, it, it's just a big question of funding. I know there's some new films that are actually getting at least some exposure from Burkina Faso now, though they're mainly documentaries. Like, I'm really hopeful that over the next decade, we might be able to see some more great films from Burkina Faso. True. And I think uh, I also was looking up in Danny Kuyate, who we discussed earlier. He has made more films since, but his most recent film in 2016 was actually made in Sweden. So maybe he's moved on to a different country. Who knows? But I think another thing that impacts the film industry in Burkina Faso and other countries is also the political stability. And unfortunately, in, in countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, Mali, Burkina Faso, there hasn't been a lot of political stability in the last two decades. Stability is not necessarily a requirement for, you know, great filmmaking. Some of the best films have come from countries undergoing turmoil at the time. But I think that has definitely been a factor in, in a number of these countries and why their cinematic output had maybe has diminished or has not reached the same heights as, as previously. And I hope not just for the cinema of the country, but for the people of the country and their, their livelihoods and well-beings as well, that those situations simmer down and they're able to pick up where they left off. So I guess we're getting near the end. Yes, we are. What would you say your, your top three films from Burkina Faso are and what uh, one or two films that you haven't seen are you most looking forward to finally exploring? Oh, that, that's a good question. Well, I would say that in terms of my uh, favorite films, like I said earlier, Tilai is my favorite. Uh, Sarunia is definitely up there. And then I would probably put the tie between uh, The Anger of the Gods and The Dreams of Dust. That would be uh, my uh, three, three to four favorites. Well, what's uh, your three favorites, Brett? Night of Truth is number one by far, by a, by a country mile. And then second, I would say it's Yaba, Grandmother. And third, I would say it's See a Dream of the Python. Those would be my top three. And then to explore, I think it might be Keita is the one that I want to see the most. Either that or one of the newer films, Frontiers, that you had mentioned that you enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Looks interesting. Or there's another one of the documentaries from just last year, actually, called Night Nursery. That one intrigues me as well. But I also want to explore some of the short films, if I can find them of Fanta Regina Nacro, because I would like to see more of her work after having really enjoyed uh, Night of Truth. I actually started a film uh, that I'm in the middle of before the podcast uh, <laughs> called uh, <laughs> uh, called uh, Tasuma, which looks like it could actually be one of my favorites from the country as well. So I'd love to <laughs> be able to to finish that one. It's uh, it's actually a comedy. It's about this aging war veteran who fought for France, who's just waiting for his uh, 
pension uh, and getting into some hijinks when he, while waiting for a pension, buys uh, a windmill thinking he'll get his pension soon. It, it's pretty funny so far. It's uh, with this kind of uh, moral commentary that, uh, you know, you're used to from uh, some of these films as well. So, so, so that, that's, that's, that's probably my, my top priority on just getting back to that one and hopefully it uh, it stands up and it's, like you said, most of these films I've been watching haven't been comedy, so that's a very worthwhile watch. It's made by a director called Kulu Sanu, who on IMDb didn't seem to have many credits at all, but uh, he's kept working and there's apparently even a sequel where I looked it up. So it's uh, it's interesting just how little exposure these films get. Uh, in terms of other films I would love to see, I'd really like to explore Apolline Traura a little bit more, especially her most recent film, uh, Des Ranches, to see like what else she has in, in store for us. Uh, and uh, beyond that, I'm not uh, 100% sure. There's, there's some... Uh, actually, there, there was one that I was reading about that I wanted to see ahead of this podcast called Del Vende, which is another one of those mid-2000 uh, films about a rural community. Uh, once again, it's about a woman being suspected of witchcraft, uh, but it's highlighted as one of the more intriguing films from the country. And like I said earlier, I've still not seen Kini and Adams by Uwe Drago, so that would also be one of those films I really really want to see yeah that one also seems interesting because it's um it's in english and it i think it's set in southern africa yeah it's set in zimbabwe because you don't see that many african films taking place in different countries for like made by one country but taking place mm. in another it's not very common yeah so. exactly i mean i, I suppose uh Sarunia is another example of that uh, and that's actually an interesting thing too, because, uh, Frontiers, I mean, it's, it's, large part of it is set in Burkina Faso, but it's very international. Uh, Valet it was set in, in part in France. So it feels like this second era or third era, however you want to put it, of Burkina Faso film is becoming a bit more international. Uh, even, you know, Dreams of Dust with its, uh, Nigerian, uh, lead. It's, it's, it's interesting to see just how it's kind of becoming this, or could become this hub of slightly more international cinema. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, through all of this, uh, the Fespaku Festival uh, has still raged on. It's a biannual festival. Uh, right. Which How did we forget to mention that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, like, just now, I remember. Like, we mentioned it in the interview. We have to uh, bring the festival in. Yeah, and for those who are unaware, like Fespaku is, I guess, I think it's the premier film festival in sub-Saharan Africa and it's unfortunate it's only held once every two years I wish it was every year but they do hand out an award for best African film at those at that festival and so it, it isn't a good chance to hear about upcoming films and upcoming directors and it's interesting that you know it did start in Ouagadougou uh, and that uh, it stayed there throughout the time as opposed to other countries that maybe have a more established and more robust national cinema. So I think that it really is a testament to the history of cinema in Africa and how Burkina Faso was part of it from the early days. Absolutely. And uh, like, I mean, the, it started in 1969. Uh, the first award was given out, uh, I believe, in 71. And there's uh, so many big films that have uh, been uh, given the title, uh, been, giving, been winning the award, including, by the way, uh, the law. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> That's one thing from uh, this um, this mini binge on Burkinabi films is I finally seen over now at least half of the films that have won the Fespaco Award and that were mentioned in um, Sharon Russell's African Cinema Guide that you had mentioned earlier in the in the podcast as well. So I finally. Now that I've reached the halfway point in both of those lists of films, I feel more confident in voicing my opinions on African cinema, despite being a uh, very much an outsider. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm not actually halfway through. I'm, ha I'm over halfway through the Sharon Russell list. I'm not halfway through the Fespaco list. Though I did see the last winner, uh, Gula de Nasra from uh, 2021, which is quite a good film. So, like you said, it, like, if you're interested in learning about African uh, cinema from any country, uh, the Fespaco Festival in Burkina Faso is one of your probably best sources. Absolutely. And I think those films are also the most likely to get distribution overseas, mm -hmm. um, whether at film festivals elsewhere or streaming platforms. Um, I know at least for me, TIFF, the Toronto International Festival, they've got a uh, year-round streaming platform now as well. 
And a lot of films that either premiered at TIFF or other festivals do eventually make their way to that platform. So it's a great opportunity to see films that are unlikely to get widespread distribution elsewhere. Absolutely. I guess uh, one other way to almost end this episode, we, we hope for better funding, more distribution, more peace in the region <laughs> and in Burkina Faso in general, more stability uh, to be able to uh, start making more films and another would be to get more international distribution through streaming services i mean hopefully through cinemas and festivals uh, as well but given how open uh, streaming has made the world and how accessible it has i mean i hope that uh, streaming services like movie which i know has released uh, several african films already i hope that those kinds of services will be another pathway to see more films from Burkina Faso and just Africa in general and FESPACO winners and all the contestants in the festival. Like, I really hope to see like just much better exposure from both the region and Burkina Faso in general. So absolutely. Hopefully that's something we can do now in 2022. It should have happened long, long ago. <laughs> it's happened a, and, a little bit more, but it should have happened a long, long time ago. Absolutely. And more restorations of classics. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, get those bad VHS rips. Like, yeah. someone just need to. I'm sure the originals are somewhere. They can just be taken out and restored. I mean, it's happening slowly and surely. I mean, mm. Scorsese's World Cinema Project, you know, picks yes. up a couple. They focus mostly, I think, from Africa. I think Senegalese films have gotten most of the acclaim. But like, I know uh, the Angolan film Semboanga, Semboanga. Forget how to say the name. Sam Bazan. Uh, I am butchering Benga? that name. Yes. Um, mm. the very famous Angolan film from the seventies or sixties got a restoration in the last year or two. That's a vast improvement. So I'm hoping that more films from the continent will be getting that treatment as well. Yes, and for the record, the, the law. Sam Bazanga, is- that's what it is. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> and the law looks great, and uh, Sarunia also looks absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so they, these are films that actually have been at least relatively kept well and re- released in proper formats. Uh, but uh, hopefully th- that happens to far, far more film. I mean, Sambuku is in VHS quality still. I mean, I wonder if that get pl- gets a proper restoration, if that's going to pop. I mean, maybe that, uh, maybe, like, I-, I don't know how that looked in the original read. Like, maybe because I know VHS is sometimes, you know, crops it a little bit as well. I mean, maybe it's a far more stunning film than I ever uh, could have imagined. It's possible. But regardless of restorations or not, I think a lot of the films that we discussed today do deserve a look at. Absolutely. And I hope that uh, we have inspired you to either seek out The Night of Truth or The Law at the very least. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, it was a delight having you on. It's, it's good having this next with just two people as well. I think it's the first one we've done of this kind. I think it worked really well. Yeah. I think we talked a lot more than we thought we would as well. Definitely. So I, I hope you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this, this format, uh, this type of examination. I mean, we'd be very interested in look at more countries as well with smaller productions that we can just dive our teeth into properly and explore and uh, maybe unearth some hidden gems. And with that, thank you once again for listening and uh, join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com. <laughs>